Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. Living life to the fullest. Living life to the fullest. That is the name, the title of the new series that we are beginning today. Uh, this series is, is based on the verse John 10.10, 10, which was in that passage that Stephen had just read. Okay, so in that passage, John 10.10 10 says, Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they have life and have it to the full. So as we read through, as we go through this series, we're going to take a look at what Jesus is saying here. What does he mean by living life, giving life to the full? Now, chapter 10 of John is a popular passage of Scripture. This passage is used a lot uh, for, with the message of salvation. It's used by evangelists, and evangelists will focus in on the, the verses where Jesus talks about laying down his life. They'll, they'll look at where he says he'll lay down his life. They'll tell of how Jesus is the good shepherd who has laid down his life for the flock. In this passage, Jesus is telling everyone how he is going to die for the sins of the world. And that his death uh, will bring new life to all who that believe. Now how this metaphor of the good shepherd, of the, of the sheep and the, and the good shepherd, this would, this would be um, a familiar metaphor to the Jews of the first century because it relates to the good shepherd from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It's that passage of scripture that's being connected here. So first century Jews would be very familiar with the passage and also the fact that Jesus is really addressing the Pharisees directly. These are the religious leaders of the, of the time and they would be very familiar with Psalm 23. So this connection Jesus is making is very familiar to the people that he's talking to. Now, all of this stuff is true. It's all in there. And it's how the message of salvation is certainly in this passage of Scripture. This is what Christians believe. Christians believe that Jesus is the good shepherd who has come and has laid his life down for us to give us eternal life. Since the life that Jesus gives us is eternal, the fullness of that life Jesus promises us is for us to have now. So many times when we hear about eternal life, we look at eternity as being beyond this life. That whatever Jesus talks about, whatever he's promising us, not that we don't believe that it's true, but we don't believe that it's true in this life. We believe that it's true in the life to come. That once we're dead and we're living in the heavenly realms, that then all these promises will come true. But that's not what's going on here. Jesus promises to give us life and give us life to the full. And eternal life begins now. Eternity is eternity. It is always eternity. So Jesus' promises are for us now. The problem is that we just don't receive them because we are so tied to the world around us that we have trouble seeing and, and listening to what Jesus is telling us. So through this series, we are going to look at the things that steal, kill, and destroy. And we're also going to look at Jesus' claims that he has come to give life Give life to the fullest. We're going to begin this series by looking at what living abundantly means. So, as we begin this series, we're looking at this passage in John chapter 10, where Jesus is talking about being the good shepherd, who has come to give abundant life to his sheep. 
Now, to better understand what this passage means, what the passage of Scripture of John 10 means, because John 10 is part of the same story which begins in John chapter 9. Because if you look at the, if you caught the little uh, thing at the, at the last verse there, it says, how can a man, how can a man who is demon possessed give sight to the blind? Well, that's because it's the, the conclusion of that story which began in chapter 9. And what begins in chapter 9 is Jesus and his disciples are going along and they notice a man on the side who has been blind since birth. This man has never seen a thing. He has been blind since birth. And his disciples say to him, what? who sinned? That's the question they ask. Who sinned? The man or his parents? Because he was born blind. Because the common thought back then was that if somebody was afflicted with blindness or they couldn't walk or whatever it was, the thought was that they were full of sin. And that God had smited them and given them a life that is full of trouble. So Jesus says, well, neither him or his parents sinned. That he is, his life is to show the glory of God. It's to show the workings of God in his life. That's what his blindness is all about. So Jesus puts mud on this guy's eyes, and he tells him to go and wash in the pool of Salome. Now the scripture tells us that the word Salome means sent. So Jesus sends the blind man to the pool of sent. Okay? Um, so he tells him, go wash in this pool. And it, it was, you know, it was a popular place that he knew where it was. He was blind, but he knew how to get there. So he, he goes and he washes. He did as Jesus instructed. And he came home seeing. He goes home and he can see now. Now think about what the people in his neighborhood are thinking about. They've known this guy that he was born blind. They've known him all his life. And because most people didn't move around a lot like we do today. Most people, it's like you were born pretty much and raised within a 20 mile radius. And he comes back and he can see. He's not blind anymore. And at first, they're looking at him and going like, that ain't him. It's just somebody who looks like him. Because it can't be him because their experience is once you're blind, you usually stay that way. Uh, it's kind of like what we were talking about with when Jesus was resurrected. It's the same thing. It's what our common experience tells us. That people who are blind don't just come home seeing one day. If they do come home seeing, now today we would see that and go like, well, he had an operation, or there was some kind of thing that happened, some kind of process that he went through, and he can see again. But that wasn't the case here. He was not, he met Jesus, Jesus told him to wash, and he did, and he could see. Now, what would be your reaction if one of your neighbors came home that way? You know, in the morning they left, they were blind, and in the evening they came home and they could see. And they had not gone through a procedure. It wasn't like they left in the morning and said, hey, I'm going to get my eyes fixed. They just left, they did what they normally do, and they come home and they're seeing. And you're asking them about, like, how did this happen? And, well, you know, this guy came up to me, put mud on my eyes, and told me to go wash in the pool of Salome, and now I can see. So, the people didn't believe, again, that he was the same person, but once they were convinced that he was... They take the man to the religious leaders. They take him to the Pharisees because they want them to know. Look at what this man Jesus can do. He can, he can restore sight to the blind. And people were, they knew about Jesus at that time because it was people were being thrown out of the synagogues if they were claiming that Jesus was the Messiah. So the stories were going surrounding at the time that going around at the time that Jesus was performing these miracles, that he the, the lame were walking, he was healing the sick, that these things were happening. So they take him to the Pharisees, and here's what the Pharisees say. They go, How did this happen? And he talk, tells them the story. 
and they're going, hmm, healing, today's the Sabbath, and healing constituted work. And the, the Pharisees are so caught up in their rules and regulations that they're going like, he healed on the Sabbath. And they were divided over this because they were saying that a, a man of God would not heal on the Sabbath because they would be breaking the Sabbath. And they that would not bode well with with the man of God. Because they're saying that he's got to be a sinner because he's not keeping the Sabbath. They're totally dismissing the fact that this guy was blind and now he can see and that Jesus is responsible for it. They're so caught up in the fact and Jesus talks to them about their blindness because they can't see what went on in front of them. They're so blinded by their system, their rules and their regulations that they can't see the miracle of God happening right before their eyes. And I just wonder how many times this happens to each and every one of us. That we're so caught up in what should be right and what's the right way of doing things and how things should be done, that God could be performing miracles right in our midst and we'll miss them because we're, we're just too concerned about other things. We're too concerned with the way we think things should be. So they're divided over whether Jesus is, 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 is demon-possessed or if he's a sinner or if he's a man of God. There's, there's a division amongst these Pharisees over this healing of this blind man. So they ask the blind man what he thinks. What do you think of this guy? And he says, I think he's a prophet. And, you know, they're, they're like, well... We're not convinced of this. We're still not convinced. They're not convinced of the whole story. So they send for the guy's parents. They want to know, was this guy, is this guy your son? And was he born blind? And if that's the truth, how is it that he can see today? And the parents come and the parents confirm it. Yeah, he's our son. He was born blind. He was blind this morning. He's not now. Now, the parents, they're a little, you know, they're being questioned, and they're, they're asked how this happened, this thing about Jesus, and all that, and they're concerned about being thrown out of the synagogue. Because being thrown out of the synagogue meant that you were, you were, you were basically being cut off from God. That's how it was equated, that you're being shut out, that the religious leaders, they held, they held the position of the go-between. They sat between the people and God. So if you weren't allowed to come into the synagogue, if you weren't allowed to be a part of the temple, if you weren't allowed to be a part of the religious system, then you were cut off from God. And the parents were very afraid of this happening. So they were going like, look, the boys of age, ask him. Ask him what happened. So they go back and they ask him again. How did this happen? And they're going like, he's like, why are you asking me again? I just told you all this. Why did it happen again? He goes, oh, I got it. You guys, do you guys want to become Jesus' disciples as well? You know, he's thinking like, well, if you're, you're so concerned about this, you must want to become his disciples. And the religious leaders at that time are going like, no way. They start hurling insults at him. They start calling him all kinds of names and stuff like that. And they ended up throwing him out of the synagogue. They just throw him out. He's done. You cannot make claims about Jesus that go against what we believe. Even though he heals you of your blindness, and they're still not sure of that, even after they have all this evidence, they throw him out of the synagogue. So Jesus hears about this, and he comes up to the man. Now, remember that the man was blind when Jesus was before him. So when Jesus comes up to him again, he doesn't know that this is Jesus. He doesn't know that this was the man who healed him of his blindness. So Jesus starts to talk to him, and um, he, you know, he, he, ta he starts to talk to him, and, and he reveals to him who he is. Because this man really wanted to be a part of what Jesus was a part of. Because this man knew the truth. He wasn't concerned with rules and regulations that were made by men. He was concerned with the fact that he was blind. 
And now he could see. So when when they when they when they go through all of this, um, the Pharisees are incensed by everything. Because they're claiming, well, we're disciples of Moses. We don't want to be disciples of Jesus. So Jesus confronts the Pharisees about this whole situation. And that's what brings us into John 10. Because in John 10, it, Jesus is, is addressing the Pharisees. And really, what Jesus is saying is really a knock against the religious leaders of the time. John 10, the, the entire chapter, is really a knock against them because the religious leaders are supposed to be the shepherds of the people. The shepherds, that shepherd metaphor is used for kings, the kings of Israel. Okay, now, the, Israel was now occupied by the Romans at this time. So there were no kings of Israel because the Roman government frowned on that kind of stuff. But the shepherds were now the religious leaders. So the religious leaders and the kings were both considered shepherds of the people. They were both considered the connection of the people to God. They were to be the shepherds over God's people. They were supposed to be looking over God's people as a shepherd would overlook their, their flock of sheep. Now Jesus equates the religious leaders who are considered the shepherds of the people, he equates them with thieves and robbers. Instead of leading the people by going before them and being an example to them, the religious leaders placed heavy burdens of rules and regulations on the people. They do this in the name of God. But instead of bringing them life, it only enslaves them to a system which restricts their growth. And it also restricts their relationship with God. Jesus was confronting their excessive rules and regulations that the religious leaders had, which he said was stealing the life from the people. Now, there are religious systems like this all over the world today where there are, are, are systems of rules and, and regulations and, and people just are, are, are caught up in, in performing certain things because they think that makes them right with, with a God or, or, or some religious thing or, or something. And there are even Christian churches that are like this today. Uh, some of you may be, even be familiar with them. Some, some of you may have come from, from places like that. Um, some, some churches can be very, very rule-oriented as far as you know, rituals and structures and stuff like that. And then on, on the other hand, you have some that it's just like anything goes. You know, there's, there's a big pendulum swing sometimes between, you know, so what's right? What's the right way? Do we need rules and regulations? Or do we need to just throw caution to the wind and, and hope everything works out? Because there is this, this tenuous relationship between having too many rules and having too few rules. But in reality, most people believe that rules are necessary for others, but not for themselves. This story isn't about rules and regulations, though. This story is about a relationship. See, we can't overlook what Jesus is saying about the shepherd and the sheep. Jesus says that his sheep listen to him because they know his voice. His sheep don't listen to strangers. In fact, they run away from strangers because they don't recognize their voice. Now, the importance of these verses is that Jesus is saying that he has a relationship with his people. That he, like a shepherd who has a relationship with their sheep, who know their sheep, he knows, they know each other. 
He talks about how the sheep recognize the voice of the shepherd and that's why they follow him. Because there's a relationship. You don't get to know somebody's voice just simply because they come in one day. There's a long-standing relationship. And Jesus emphasizes the relationship that he has with his people. And it is in this relationship where we have this fullness of life. Jesus equates the religious leaders with as thieves and robbers because of stealing the life of the people with the rules and the regulations. At best, he is comparing them to hired hands who in reality don't care about the sheep. They're only concerned with their wages. They're not concerned with the relationship. There is no relationship. Now, this is something we experience in many aspects of our lives. In many aspects of our lives, we, we have different things where there's rules and regulations, or we have a relationship. In the workforce, we expect that there are going to be rules and regulations that must be followed in order for everything to run smoothly. However, there are some places that really go overboard with the rules. There's places that go overboard and it's so micromanaged and over the top with rules and regulations, it's, it's just, you can just see there's no relationship between, between the employers and the employees. There's just no relationship. It's just a matter of getting the job done. And nobody's trying to help one another out. Everybody has their own agenda. They're just trying to get through each and every day with basically not getting into any trouble. Um, there's a TV show called Undercover Boss where the basically the head of the company, and these are usually pretty big companies, uh, most of us heard of most of these companies, where the, the, the head guy goes in disguise and goes and works alongside of the people who work for him. And they get there, and they, you know, they just show up as they're, they're being trained, and they work alongside of people. And there's a common theme that runs through this show. Because as the boss gets to know, and it's not to say that these were bad companies to begin with, but most of the times, the person at the top wants to, wants to be able to effectively run the company better than what it is already. They feel that there's some sort of sense of, of, of loss of something. That it could just that things could just be better, and what they do is they go and they start talking to the people that they're working with, and what happens is they start to form relationships with the with the people. They get involved in the lives of the people, and it's with these relationships with the people and with their families that they they uh, they make the changes. They base their changes with the with the thoughts of the people that work for them and their families, and how the job that they go to each and every day, which they spend most of their time at, how it affects their life. And this is how they, they go about making changes to make the company run better. And the companies run better, running better usually makes the company more financially sound. So they find that a company that, is, that has better relationships between employee and employers, that they're, they're running better. That the result is that people are working for each other. That they're trying to help one another to get the job done better. So, um, consider the relationships in your life. Now, are there a bunch of rules and regulations that govern your personal relationships? I would say probably not, because if that was the case, I wouldn't think it would be much of a relationship. It would just be rules and regulations that you're following to try to please one another. But our relationships go much better when we are in tune with one another. When we are in tune with how one another feel about things. When we when we know how another person feels about certain issues, that we just don't push buttons to upset one another, but instead we try to enhance the relationship 
by doing for one another, by helping one another, by understanding how each other see life and trying to make it better for each other. The rules are basically don't act or speak in a manner that would be offensive to one another. In a relationship, we are always looking out for the needs of each other. It is in these types of relationships where we thrive and where we, where we grow. So throughout this series, what we're going to look at is the different aspects of relationships with each other and with God. And we're going to see what Jesus means by living abundantly. Because I believe that living abundantly begins by having a relationship with God. By having peace with God. And this peace comes in knowing that our sins are forgiven. This peace comes in knowing that we don't have to follow a rigid system of rules and regulations to earn our way into God's good graces. But that God has through his grace and through his love and through his desire to have a relationship with each and every one of us. That he sent Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. That through Jesus, God extended his love and his mercy towards us. And we have to believe. And we have to desire this relationship in return. This is found in a relationship not in a bunch of rules that nobody really understands. Now, this is not to say that we don't need to follow certain things because we are told to obey God's commandments. But the commandments, if we look closely at them, and we will look at some of these throughout the series, that if we look at the commandments, God is just telling us who he is. And everything that God tells us is for our lives to be better. And Jesus tells us that our Heavenly Father knows our names. He knows who we are. He says He is the Good Shepherd. And He knows His sheep. And His sheep know Him. This week, look at your relationships. Which one bring you life? And which relationships seem to just suck the life out of you? Take a hard look at why these relationships correspond in the ways that they do. And also look at your relationship with God. Do you have a relationship with him? Or is what you know about him simply a set of rules and regulations? Do you see a relationship with God as giving you a full and abundant life? Or do you instead see God as basically taking all the fun out of your life? And if that's so, why is that? Because I know that's true for a lot of people. That they just can't come to want it, to even know about God because what they equate God with is a bunch of rules and regulations. What they equate God with is stealing all their fun from them. But Jesus says, I have come to give you life and to give you life abundantly. So what do you believe about that? Jesus has promised this, us, this abundant life. The people around him were divided. When Jesus talked about being the good shepherd, when Jesus healed this man, the people around him were divided. Those who believed, they wanted to listen to Jesus. 
They wanted to know more about Jesus. But those who didn't believe, they, put, they didn't want to hear another word from Jesus from that point on. Because what they did was they put their faith in their religious systems that they created. They put more faith in the system that they created than they did in Jesus himself. These divisions still run through the world today. The question is, what do you believe brings fullness of life? Let me pray for you. Dear Lord, you come to us and you tell us that you are the good shepherd. That you are the one who has come to give us life and to give us life to the fullest. You tell us that you came and that you laid down your life. That you willingly came and gave your life up so that we could have life in your name. So Lord, we thank you for that. But Lord, we know that it is all too often that people look at a religious system. And that's who they believe you are. That you represent the system. And they don't see a fullness of life. They don't see an abundance of life. They just see a bunch of rules and regulations. But Lord, your word is so much different than just rules and regulations. Lord, your word tells us that you desire a relationship with us. And that we are not to systemize what you tell us about you. That we are supposed to handle a relationship with you as we would handle a relationship with other. But that the relationship that we should have with you, and that we should have with one another, and that we should have with every aspect within our lives, should be one of mutual benefit. One where we're lifting up and helping one another. That's what you called us to. So, Lord, I pray that as we continue throughout this series, that we will truly come to an understanding of what you mean when you say that you have come to give us life and to give us life to the fullest. Lord, we thank you for coming. We thank you for the life that you bring. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. And we do this all in the name of Jesus.